This is Citations Needed with Nima Shirazi and Adam Johnson. Welcome to Citations Needed, a podcast on media, power, PR, and the history of bullshit. I am Nima Shirazi. I'm Adam Johnson. Thanks, everyone, for listening this week. You can, of course, follow the show on Twitter at Citations Pod. Like, share, comment, do whatever on Facebook at Citations Needed and help us out, fund the show, keep it going through patreon.com forward slash citations needed podcast with Nima Shirazi and Adam Johnson. You'll find us on there. All your help is so much appreciated. Yeah, sorry to keep uh, having to push that, but it actually does it does help. So if you've thought about doing it but haven't donated, please do. It does, it does make it sustainable. And uh, we want to be sustainable because um, that makes a better show. Uh, so... <laughs> So today's episode is has been touched on many times, but never really talked about directly, uh, and that's the media's obsession with civility, norms, and manners, and how that is uniquely incapable of protecting us from the forces on the right. Mm -hmm. In the media, we see weasel words used to describe things that really should just be called what they are. So rather than saying that lies have been told, we hear that there are falsehoods. Uh, it's not racism. It's just racially charged commentary. It's not torture. It's just enhanced interrogation techniques. We can't be too crude. You, you can't mock the honorable John McCain. You can't use bad words. You can't be negative about public figures. For years, the U.S. media has prioritized, above all else, norms and civility in their discourse. Op-eds explicitly advocating dirty wars, coups, the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians, propping up fascist governments, propping up dictatorships, uh, the shooting of unarmed protesters, the bombing of eight countries at once, as we currently are. All these things are factored in. They're just part of the equation. What's rhetorically out of bounds, traditionally... And what isn't is far more product of power than it is any any objective notion of civility or decency. So where did where did these so-called norms come from? A question we ask all the time on the show is who do they benefit? And why is their maintenance, even in the in the face now of overt white nationalism, of a rise of literal Nazism again, even in that time where we are now, why is the highest priority still for so many liberals and centrists in the U.S. media, why is civility the primary goal? To discuss this and more, later in the show, we'll be speaking with Ashley Feinberg, senior reporter at The Huffington Post. I mean, well, liberals and centrists are the ones who love norms the most because it's how they show the right that they're objective and that they care about standards and that they... Uh, are on their side, actually, because they just want the truth. But I mean, it is all done with complete insincerity and in total bad faith on the right, because they don't give a shit about uh, how polite you're being to whoever. Like, they just want some excuse to hammer on you and they'll find it no matter what. And just giving in is already made defeat before you've even started fighting. So th there was a telling incident recently over the over the last few weeks we talk about language a lot on the show, and I think it's something that we prioritize a lot, but sort of goes under the radar. But the term racially charged actually became part of a popular discourse and solicited write-ups in Slate.com and other outlets criticizing it because the second the news about Roseanne's show being being canceled – for those who live under a rock, Roseanne tweeted out a, an exceedingly racist tweet. Uh, her show was summarily canceled, uh, much to the relief of, I think, most most um, right-minded people. Several outlets referred to her tweet, which was by every objective measure a racist tweet, as being racially charged. Yeah, so you saw the Los Angeles Times write a tweet, uh, breaking news, ABC cancels Roseanne following stars racially charged comments. Channel 10 TV said that they were controversial. The, the comments were, were controversial. Politico tweeted, sitcom star Roseanne apologized for making a racially charged comment about a former Barack Obama advisor who was African-American. We saw this 
Also, from The the Hill, published a, a number of articles where they said that Wanda Sykes was quitting the show after a racially charged tweet, also uh, referred to the tweet as racially charged a number of other times. We saw it from entertainment media like Inside Edition and E.T. Roseanne canceled after Star's racially charged tweet, apologizes after racially charged tweet. Even Newsweek, right. I don't know why I said even Newsweek, <laughs> as if they're somehow better. That was funny. Also, Newsweek said Wanda Sykes quits Roseanne after Barr's racially charged Twitter rant. Uh, racially charged is apparently the new euphemism for racist. Yeah, and then there was a pushback, and then the New York Times subsequently, after the pushback, used the term racist, which I think some people probably appreciated. It does show you that there's these terms that are kind of used, that there's a general editorial instinct to want to downplay calling things bad things. So we saw this with NPR, um, who is the worst at this, because they're so obsessed with not looking like they're the liberal media, they had on their spokesperson to explain why – on Morning Edition to explain why they never call Trump's lies lies or refer to Trump as a liar. Uh, she said that she went to go look at the definition of Oxford English Dictionary to seek the definition of lie, which she said was, quote, a false statement made with intent to deceive. And then she went on to say, quote, intent being the key word there without the ability to peer into John Donald Trump's head. I can't tell you what his intent was. Right. I can tell you what he said and how that it squares or doesn't square with facts. Now, by this standard, of course, you could never call anyone right, a liar. Right. Without knowing what their intention is, which means that actually, actually the only way you could like be a liar is if you call yourself a liar because you knowingly lied. Right. Lots of terms in the English language involve theory of mind. They involve – mens rea of some kind, right? You're, you're assuming a degree of ill intent by using what, you know, normal human beings do, which is pattern recognition, which is after the hundredth time Trump has been corrected on something or the thousandth time he's lied and he kind of winks and nods at the camera that knowing he's lying and sort of even will tell you he's lying that like, I think we're in the safe spot now where we can call it a lie. But because of this civility fetish, because there are people in the media who can't look like they're partisan or they're overreaching or too, God forbid, the I word, ideological, we routinely come to these terms and these labels that are on their face deeply inadequate to describe the forces that, are, that have emerged on the right, which is an ideology manifested by Trump but not limited to him that is increasingly able to take this fetish, to take this fear – and to use it to their advantage, um, just as they have with you know free speech absolutism, which you know obviously Richard Spencer just admitted was a wedge to create space for Nazi ideology. They've taken the civility fetish and completely dunked on liberals and Democrats, whose only recourse is more fact checking and more sir sir sirism. Yeah, the, it seems like the idea that agreeing to disagree is basically the the highest order of partisan politics for the media and also for a lot of politicians. As if basically all of this is just like a matter of of rhetorical flourish or like witty repartee instead of politics having like actually very real implications for the people who live and die under the rather uncivil bombs that are dropped on them and the very uncivil threats that are made about overthrowing countries and, and uncivil policies that encourage families to be like torn apart from each other or land to be destroyed by extractive policies. These are real things that are not civil, but as long as you kind of don't use bad words and don't call names, then basically it's deemed to be totally reasonable regardless of the actual implications of this stuff. We saw this most I, – I think the Twitter terms of service is a really great distillation of this concept, yeah. which is to say decency and civility appeals are almost always about protecting people in power because the oppression, subjugation, and condescension of and abuse of those out of power is simply factored into the equation. And I thought a really yeah. uh, fascinating example of this was, so Twitter updated their terms of service last year, and this is their terms of service for for violence. Calls for violence, right? It, yeah, this is calls for violence, which are a violation of the terms of service for Twitter. But they said, quote, Groups included in this policy will be those that identify as such or engage in activity both on and off the platform that promotes violence. This policy does not apply to military or government entities. So Twitter's terms of service specifically has a carve out yeah. for people in power. So you can post something saying – and this has obviously happened several times. 
we need to bomb Iran or we need to uh, shoot protesters in Palestine or we need to uh, have regime change in North Korea or we need to have a coup in Venezuela, that that is acceptable right. forms of provocation. Those are all completely civil discourse. Right. But telling, you know, Jeff Bezos or Donald Trump to go, you know, sit on a on a bicycle without a seat, that that's promotion of violence. Now, of course, in the former uh, example, my words are far more likely to actually affect violence, which is to say a high status person advocating op-ed in the Washington Post, coup cool regime change, that in the aggregate, that is far more actual material effect yeah. than, you know, someone telling the president to go fuck himself or someone telling a high status journalist that that they should be removed from society or some sort of delete your existence or some sort of right. thing that's gotten people suspended. Now, without focusing too much on Twitter, I do, I do think that, that that asymmetry and the sort of complete formal codification of the protection of power as a way of policing, you know, civility or, or norms is a really finite and sort of, I think, unequivocal example of how these concepts are meant to indemnify power. They're meant to protect power. Right. Um, and another example of this was was a piece written in The Atlantic in uh, August of last year. It was a 12,000 word sort of magnum opus by a writer named Kurt Anderson about the the descent of America into conspiracy theory. That there was this radical fringe on both the right and the left that had ruined the country. Now, it's worth noting that the biggest conspiracy theory of our generation, your, you and my generation, is the idea that Iraq helped do 9-11. Right. Which, of course, admits that, which, which fits the textbook definition of conspiracy, cherry-picked evidence – Paranoia, right, right, literal collusion between yeah. these like evil entities conspiring together without against evidence the, against um, the, the noble United States and its people. Right. So this is a textbook definition of a conspiracy theory. Turns out not to be true, as as most conspiracy theories definitionally don't. This was omitted from his twelve thousand word official history, and of course the reason why it was is the person who edits him, the managing editor. The head of The Atlantic, Jeffrey Goldberg, was the number one promoter of this conspiracy theory. <laughs> right. Whoops. Uh, now, and then he says over and over again in the, in the piece that he uses these ableist and kind of tautological labels, crazy, insane, delusional, to speak about what he calls postmodern leftist, the anti-war left. He, he claims falsely that the uh, Weather Underground set off, quote, thousands of bombs in the early 70s. The total number of bombs that were set up by all terrorist groups in the United States was 400, right, uh, 540. Right. But the point is to sort of say, oh, there's these loony crazies who have sort of gone too far. Yeah. And what what's never really reconciled is that through this time period, one is this raises the question of, was it considered crazy or insane or delusional to kill 3 million Indo-Chinese in Vietnam? Was the CIA's use of you know torture and, and coups and dirty wars and executions, are these things considered crazy? And of course, the answer is no, because they're sort of factored in, that violence is factored into the system and that the only people who can be uncivil or be conspiracy theorists are, by definition, people who are not factored in. Right. And those who are then challenging that, which is why certainly from the 60s and beyond, and I'm sure before that as well, protesters, and definitely when it came to civil disobedience, that people that challenged power – that took to the streets, that actually challenged and fought against these policies, whether it was for civil rights, whether it was against Vietnam, et cetera, et cetera. And you can take that all the way up the decades, you know, since those are often deemed to be kind of too loud, too radical. They're not inclusive enough, even though they're pretty much the most inclusive of, you know, marginalized and vulnerable communities. Um, and yet protests are seen like, oh, well, you know, are they going to shut down traffic? Like, is my commute going to be fucked up? Because like, I think there are better ways to do that. And so what you see is the policies that are being challenged, right? The wars, the invasions, the deportations, et cetera, whatever it may be, those are never uncivil. Those are never uncouth, but challenging them in certain ways is insufficiently respectful. Yeah. You see this over and over and over and over again with the way in which certain liberals talk about protest, that there's this there's this sort of black and white, rose-tinted civil rights movement that was nonviolent. And anything that involves a burnt trash can or or a you know dumpster turned over is somehow an affront to all humanity. Now, uh, Samantha B did a very egregious version of this. We I think we we mentioned this on an episode for J20. 
But I do think it's ironic that now she's being attacked by yeah. and almost and sold out by a lot of the civility police among the liberal class for using the C word cunt, which I feel weird saying. <laughs> uh, but apparently it's pretty routine in Australia, which I find bizarre. Um, <laughs> back when there was protests in the wake of Trump winning, she took to the air to left punch those who were doing, quote unquote, anarchy shit. Oh, God damn it. There is nothing the left can't lose, including the moral high ground. If you jerks are just trying to get all your anarchy shit out of the way before President Trump gets control of the FBI, I hate to tell you this, you're too late. You just gave middle America an excuse to dismiss all these peaceful protesters as undemocratic sore losers. Thanks. And so the clip shows her version of a good protester yeah. is a bunch of people with like pre-made moveon.org signs and like one even has like an infant in their arms shaking the hands of cops. Like this right. is somehow the sort of ideal. Like the ultimate like Pepsiification of protest. Yeah. Now, one could argue that this theory of power she has or this disposition about power is probably one of the reasons that she was obsessed with reaching out to Glenn Beck and, and promoted and, and helped revitalize him right after the election as a kind of anti-Trump coalition now, a few weeks ago, Beck came out as a Trump supporter and is now very pro-Trump because one could argue that maybe ideology matters more than tone uh, and people who fetishize tone and don't have the ideology. Uh, I think there was a really great line that Brandy Jensen used in a, uh, on Twitter where she said about people who use the term alt-left. Uh, she said, they're like my dog. They can understand tone but not substance. And I think that that's part of the civility is about that. It, it effectively renders us all dogs where we can sort of see – tone and disposition, but the actual substance right. is secondary to that. Well, which is why there can always be this false call for balance so that basically if a racist is fired somewhere in the woods, you must find someone else on the more liberal side who said something kind of nasty about one individual that is supposed to be revered, and therefore they can be fired too and balance is restored to the universe. It's this idea where reality of the implications and consequences of policy mean nothing, and that it's all right. It's all about tone. It's the reason uh, George H.W. Bush could declare after the U.S. Navy shot down a civilian Iranian airliner over the Persian Gulf in 1988, Bush on the on the campaign trail at the time bellowed out that he would never apologize for America no matter what the facts are, while then there was, uh, you know, no uproar about that kind of fucking comment when over 200 civilians were, were blown out of the sky, while the same guy, George H.W. Bush, caught a little flack when he kind of quaintly called Bill Clinton and Al Gore bozos in 1992. Right. There's a total disconnect that like that was some sort of outrage because it was politically unsavory because he used the word bozo. Right. And yet you can just say, you know, whatever the fuck you want about the United States killing, murdering hundreds of people. It's not not ever gauged the same way. Yeah, and this is why the media has to sort of circle the wagons to make sure that we're not too sensationalist or we don't sort of call into question power too much. So there was a another example of the of the limits of the term racially charged was in 2015, this caused a little bit of an uproar too. There were emails that were leaked by Ferguson police officers that included lines such as a picture of, of Ronald Reagan feeding a baby monkey – uh, and one of the police officers says, quote, a rare photo of Ronald Reagan babysitting Barack Obama in 1962. Uh, then someone said in another email, there's a new Muslim clothing shop that opened in our shopping center, but they threw me out after I asked if I could look at some of their bomber jackets. Then there was a story making fun of a black suspect in saying that Leroy's last child support payment um, after they had been killed. Now, one would look at this, right. and I think an objective person would say, this is, these are racist emails. This is how the, the, the Washington Post framed it. They said, these are the racially charged emails that got three Ferguson police and court officials fired. Right. The mediaite said, here are the three racially charged emails. Those are racist. And yet the headline calls them racially charged. Right. And the reason why editors do this, and I know this, and, I'm, and I can be even somewhat sympathetic, is that it's sort of drilled into their mind to not be too sensational. But you can be sensational about people who can't call you, who don't have PR firms who can call you, right? So I can say the most sensational things about North Korea or Syria or whatever. Like, it's not like the fucking Assad regime is going to pick up a phone and call me. But if I criticize police officers or if I criticize Israel or if I criticize the U.S. military, 
I'm going to get a lot of phone calls mm-hmm. that are going to be super angry. So you see this constant rounding down where civility and the instinct towards civility is only reserved for one group of people, and that's people who are usually in the centers of power. Yeah. Now, the emphasis on civility has been in our discourse for millennia. I mean, this is this is not something that is new. This is certainly not something that is born of the Trump era, going back to the ancient Roman term, pugna verborum. It's kind of means the battle of words or really like fighting words, them's fighting words. And uh, St. Augustine wrote that, you know, once you have those kind of fighting words, the best thing to do in the face of that, especially is talking about the existence of God because of what he wrote about. But when you when you kind of get those those difficult words, you're better to keep silent. It's better to just keep silent in the face of them. 17th century philosophers John Locke and Thomas Hobbes both address civility in their own writings, favoring tolerant society. Locke called for something called, quote, mutual charity, whereas Hobbes called for, quote, civil silence, uh, something more akin to what we would think of as like public discretion. Say whatever you want in private, but don't air those grievances in public, don't have any kind of public debates or public outrage. And you see this all the time in our current discourse. I mean, from Barack Obama, even just back in in 2010, before Trump was really a thing in the way that he is now, Obama speaking in 2010 at the National Prayer Breakfast said, at times it seems like we're unable to listen to one another to have at once a serious and civil debate. And this erosion of civility in the public square sows division and distrust among our citizens. It poisons the well of public opinion. It leaves each side little room to negotiate with the other. It makes politics an all or nothing sport where one side is either always right or always wrong when In reality, neither side has a monopoly on truth. And this is seen time and again. It's the same impulse that led lawyer Joseph Welsh to declare famously to Joe McCarthy in 1954, have you no sense of decency, sir? Uh, It's the same thing where you see politicians falling over themselves to praise the civility that John McCain has brought to public discourse. He stood up for civility, he stood up for goodness, and he did that time and time again for all of us that have worked with him. And I'll end with his own quote. I hope we can again rely on humility, on our need to cooperate, on our dependence on each other, to learn how to trust each other again, and by so doing, better serve the people who elected us. If anyone can teach us how to do that, it's John McCain. John McCain is the human manifestation of the civility fetish, right? Yeah. Because he can promote the most disgusting, most violent policies, obviously the war in Iraq. We don't need to relitigate that. Uh, the bombing in, in Libya, which has led to open air slave markets. He lied. He went on Jay Leno and lied about Iraq being behind the anthrax attacks. He um, supports a number of other proxy wars, arms, armed insurrections, the funding and arming of, of sectarian groups in the Middle East. He himself committed certain crimes in, in, in Vietnam. That all these things are sort of, again, they're factored and in. And has since used racially charged epithets about people Vietnamese, from right. Vietnam. But they don't count because anti-Asian racism is just factored in. Right. And this, by the way, he reserves the right to do it till this day. And it told a reporter as much uh, less than six, seven years ago. So, again, this right. is the sort of – because he, he says nice things on the Senate floor, he's – that's OK. Because the issue is not are you being civil to people of color or are you being civil to the poor or are you being civil to people in the global south? It's are you being civil to an ABC reporter? Right. Are you being civil to George Bush? Are you being civil – To your own class, To right? your own class, right. There's a – book from 2006 called Revolutionary Characters, What Made the Founders Different, written by historian Gordon Wood. And in this book, he explains about the founders of the United States, right? Those luminaries, the founding fathers, and how they really were obsessed with this with this notion of civility. And so here's what Gordon Wood writes, quote, the 18th century Anglo-American Enlightenment was preoccupied with politeness, which meant affability, sociability, cultivation. Indeed, politeness was considered the source of civility, which was soon replaced by the word civilization. 
end quote. So you'll see basically how the Jeffersons and Franklins and Adamses and Washingtons, especially George Washington was completely obsessed with this idea of etiquette and politeness. And you'll see how that was their version of not being this scrappy colonial upstart in kind of opposition to Europe, but of a piece with Europe, that they were as civil and as civilized as the Europeans. Meanwhile, these are the people who own fucking slaves. These are the people who were genociding Native Americans. I, I mean, this is so it's clear how even in the effort to say, we are being so polite. We write and we speak with the utmost civility. Policies actually matter. What those people are actually doing to other humans actually matter. Are you suggesting that ideology actually matters? What? No, Maybe. never. Not on this show, Adam. Um, which this is a great segue to our guest who's been waiting in these waters for many years and has been the subject of many of these, of these civility police and civility fetishes that we're talking about. So we will be joined in just a sec by senior reporter for the Huffington Post, Ashley Feinberg. Stick with us. We are joined now by Ashley Feinberg, senior reporter at the Huffington Post. Ashley, so great to have you today on Citations Needed. Great to be here. So, Ashley, we, we, when we decided to do an episode about civility politics, this was specifically in relation to a, a media habit which we talk about at the top of the show where people won't say words that are kind of provocative, that there's a kind of New York Timesification mm -hmm. uh, generally in media that if things are sort of seen as being sensational, that you're being tabloidy, even if life itself is sensational and that we, won't, we must always err on the side of watering down. And I, and of course, the first thing I said, I said, I said we should get Ashley to do this <laughs> because that's her whole shtick. Um, yeah. You have been caught in, in several rows, several rows involving norms and civility, uh, the fetishization of which I think personally has, has grown uh, mm -hmm. greatly under, under Trump, who, of course, doesn't have such, um, such concerns. Um, now, you, you're, you're the most famous uh, instance was when you made a joke, I think a quite funny joke about John yeah, McCain. Yeah. yeah, we're all we're all big fans of that joke. I mean, it's a also, joke. The, the, the main issue with that tweet in retrospect was that it wasn't entirely factually accurate because his wife actually has more money. So like that is my biggest shame really in uh, assuming it was that. factually accurate for those who don't know. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's actually lay it out for the if you, if you don't mm -hmm. mind, Ashley, I don't want to. Uh, no, I mean, go for it. It's, it's out there. Yeah. OK. Um, this was right when uh, McCain came out and courageously and bravely and maverickly supported the mm -hmm. uh, tax, the Republican tax bill, which was a huge windfall for the super wealthy, which includes, incidentally, the McCain family. Uh, and you tweeted out, congratulations to John McCain's wife and children on their upcoming tax-free inheritance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good joke. That's solid. Obviously, this, mean, was, this was also in the backdrop of McCain being recently diagnosed with a brain tumor. Well, right. That's the thing is actually when I first did it, I, I'd forgotten that that was even part of it. Oh, and so yeah. everyone was getting so mad and I couldn't figure out why everyone was so mad about this. And then all of a sudden I was like, oh, that's what happened. You're so, like, oh, because of the whole, uh, yeah. like, going to die part. Yeah, I mean, like, everyone, like, he, you're, he's 90 years old. He's, like, maybe he's immortal, but, like, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> and John McCain is really the sort of most protected of all the manners trolls. Oh, yeah. Can you talk to us about what that experience and other experiences, I know that you, you're, you're a frequent right-wing punching bag, have taught you about our notions of civility and norms and in this obsession with policing people, even by supposed liberals and centrists, mm -hmm. of policing those who've kind of, quote, gone too far. I mean, well, liberals and centrists are the ones who love norms the most because it's how they show the right that they're objective and that they care about standards and that they uh, are on their side, actually, because they just want the truth. But I mean, it is all done with complete insincerity and in total bad faith on the right because... They don't give a shit about uh, how polite you're being to whoever. Like, they just want some excuse to hammer on you, and they'll find it no matter what. And just giving in is uh, already made defeat before you've even started fighting. Yeah, so you're also the reporter who broke the story and released the transcript of the meeting that James Bennett, the head of the New York Times op-ed mm -hmm. page, held with staff at the Times uh, following, like, one of the very many... Barry Weiss related uh -huh. shitty tweet outrage storms 
What was really revealed in your reporting and certainly in kind of reading that transcript of the meeting is how um, the tone from Bennett and the New York Times leadership in general is one of really just pleading for civility. How the problem is not what's being said by the reporters or by the columnists, rather, but the airing of dirty laundry publicly. Mm -hmm. Can you kind of talk about that whole episode and your take on how revealing that staff meeting was in general mm -hmm. and what it says about where that kind of ivory tower yeah. of journalism is in terms of where it puts its focus? Yeah, I mean, well, what's really interesting is that some of this, the, the questions that were being asked by the staff of that meeting had come from like questions that had been submitted beforehand and there were apparently a lot more sort of aggressive questions that some staffers had wanted to ask that they just chose not to, I guess, because they didn't want to upset Bennett or seem mean or <laughs> like any sort of like real criticism now is equated with meanness and being mm -hmm. crass. And it's, I mean, it's absurd. It's, it's how you sort of get to this place where Bennett gets, like, I, th I think in that meeting he said, it's basically like unquestioned that capitalism is like the greatest anti-poverty engine that the U.S. has ever uh, encountered, which just it went completely in question, which just blew my mind because, yeah. yeah, I mean, to question that is to basically question everything the Times is based on and to question that is to be unfair in their side. That was such a revealing piece of information, I think, because we, mm -hmm. we, we talk a lot about ideology of media editors and producers and such on the show. And mostly it's through inference. We kind of try to infer based on patterns what the acceptable parameters of debate are. And this was the first time in a while that you have someone who's probably, I think by my estimation, the most influential mm -hmm. media curator in English language media kind of coming out and saying, there are these things we can debate. Um, if you take Brett Stevens, for example, clearly the the baseline humanity of trans people mm -hmm. or climate change, these are sort of debatable things. Right. But capitalism is axiomatic, um, mm -hmm. and to question that is sort of outside of the box of acceptable thought. And that was super revealing because it shows that I think part of the obsession with policing norms is, mm -hmm. for lack of a better term, putting style over substance, which is we need to police how we talk. But anything that's too sort of mean to people in power mm -hmm. is off limits. And that which is mean to people who are, you know, from marginalized communities, whether they be trans or Palestinians or people who sort of don't have you, you typically in centers of power. Mm -hmm. Um, that's totally fair game. That is not a violation of norms to say nothing of, you know, bombing countries and all the other fun stuff we talked about at the top of the show. Right. I mean, like the sort of the like the grossness of it all is that in kind of instilling these norms and trying to maintain this sort of sense of uh, politeness, it is how you kind of get to this place where the be, being able to d debate the humanity of your own staffers is uh, completely out of the realm of thought. And otherwise you get to have this status quo where nothing you really say can be questioned because to question that is to be unprofessional and to go outside this realm of acceptable thought. I think what we keep seeing, especially recently um, with the rise of Trump, but also before that, is this idea that because now Twitter exists, mm -hmm. um, the rabble is getting too unruly, and it kind of manifests in, in a number of ways. It's that now that regular people, the people down there, mm -hmm. can be heard and can react and can actually respond directly to these, you know, whether it's politicians, whether it's reporters, whether it's uh, pundits, whatever it is, the immediate backlash is what seems to be so offensive to people with these platforms, with this privilege and, and power, and that that's why there's this call for like, yeah. can everyone please be nice because <laughs> you're all yelling at me because I keep saying shit and I used to just be able to write it and I would never hear from you. Right. Um, so like, how do you see the rise of technology both um, helping in this pushback, but also then giving more ammunition to the people who collapse on their on their fainting couch with the vapors as soon as someone kind of calls them out for being racist. Yeah, I mean, well, that's so fascinating because, I mean, the, the reason the Times says they got rid of their public editor is because Twitter is the public editor now and they have the masses who will keep them in line. But what has actually ended up happening is that as soon as any sort of larger group of people starts criticizing them, they immediately claim that they're being attacked and they're getting death threats because someone called them an idiot. 
and they completely disregard any sort of criticism from this entire swath of people they claim are the ones who are replacing this public editor who they were actually forced to answer to regardless of how terrible they were at their job. But <laughs> yeah. uh, the really interesting thing I think is that the Times has been so used to not being criticized for so long that they have no idea yeah, they, how to their brains handle melt. it now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they don't understand why this is happening and they don't understand that people can be making legitimate points even if they're telling them to go fuck themselves. It's like they were kind of only the paper of record by default mm -hmm. because they couldn't hear what anyone right. else was saying I mean, in response to what they were writing. This is why John Chait writes a piece every like, you know, six months about how, how he, the, the, the Twitter hordes are ruining the discourse because he used to be able to go on to the New Republic and write a page a piece condescending everyone and being, you know, trafficking in, yeah. in uh, pro-war narratives and all sorts of, and then no, I mean, what, what was the response? A letter to the editor? Mm -hmm. Now you just get dunked on by a bunch of assholes with rose emojis and you have no recourse like you you know you're completely <laughs> stupefied i don't want to get too inside the baseball on twitter because i know that between yeah. between the three of us we have about 85 million tweets <laughs> i i do think that the the way that at jack has handled the ways in which they police twitter is super interesting and really i think speaks to the larger civility uh, fetish in, in general which of course has no concept of power or power asymmetry or power dynamics um mm. so as we discussed in the top of the show twitter has a specific carve out for allowing for the avocation of violence for, quote, government and military accounts. And I think this really speaks to this sort of this this notion of what we mean by civility, which is that civility for some, not for others. I think this also is not unrelated to the rise of the, the total uh, asymmetrical way in which Jack deals with Nazis on Twitter versus people who say the word fuck. Um, right. Can we talk about the the prevalence of Nazis on Twitter I mean, I've seen several, several anecdotes, and this is not scientific, but I'm pretty sure it's accurate, where very mild pushback or, or vulgarity by leftists is, is met with a swift ban hammer, to use an old Gawker phrase. Um, mm -hmm. And But the worst kind of anime Nazis sort of go unimpeded. Yeah, I mean, the, well, this is uh, the, sort of the same like impetus behind that is also what's sort of driving this whole argument for going back to this civility, because it's, for whatever reason, the right has sort of manage to get these institutions to cower to them in ways that the left still hasn't figured out how to do. And it's was it exemplified when Jack sort of immediately apologized and the, said he was launching this investigation into how Candace Owens, the TPUSA urban outreach person, I think is her mm -hmm. title, she was called far right. And he was falling yes. over himself to apologize to her. <laughs> and meanwhile, the O'Brien is like actively getting death threats on Twitter in public and there is mostly nothing happening to these people. And uh, I will DM Jack these like tweets and be like, hey, man, like, I'm not sure if you saw this. And I can see that he's read them and he's read all of them, but nothing happens. Yeah. Can you actually talk just a little bit more about what you're currently seeing with the Luke O'Brien case or situation? Because uh, he's a colleague of yours. Mm -hmm. um, at the Huffington Post and just um, how his doing his actual job, being an investigative reporter, reporting on one of the most vicious and vile hate spewers on the Internet, Amy Mech, uh, what what you're seeing, maybe they're talking to him or just inside of HuffPo about what's going on. Yeah, I mean, uh, so basically like what has happened is or what happened is that Amy Mech or Amy Meckelberg, uh, before the story went up, went on Twitter and uh, told her followers that uh, Luke O'Brien was uh, basically trying to destroy her life and was contacting everyone she's ever worked with. And uh, so it started even before the post went up. And uh, yeah, I mean, he's, he's been getting tweets, uh, sending him his own address and telling him that, like, to watch his back and sending him, like, photos of, like, people shooting journalists and, like, ISIS beheading journalists. And there's, like, all these, like, very aggressive threats that uh, are apparently not the same sort of uh, violent threat that Twitter sees as Luke O'Brien telling someone to perform a wrestling move on themselves, which is what got him suspended in the first place. Wow. Yeah, he actually suggested that someone DDT themselves, which yeah. is a great thing to tell someone to do. It's, it's yeah. Jake the Snake Roberts, you know, signature move. And I've often wished people would DDT themselves myself. I'm trying to curb the wrestling references on the show, but to no avail. <laughs> it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Yeah. So th I think to this point about um, what we view as being this extortion racket by the right, uh, the, mm -hmm. that they saw this with the Roseanne stuff where it's 
they kept trying to audition liberals to go after after Roseanne. And then immediately the right wing media machine needed to find some sort of symmetrical example, mm-hmm. right? Because they, they obsess over this this idea. And then the centrist media, corporate media in general, always kind of plays along with it. So first they went, they tried to go after Bill Maher. Then I think they kind of realized that liberals don't care about Bill Maher. I mean, everyone, I, I was stoked for them to go after Bill Maher. Like, <laughs> yeah. Great. yeah. Like, we're like, do it. <laughs> I mean, even, I think even less so maybe five years ago, even, even sort of most normie liberals now increasingly find him to be super gross. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they tried to go after Joy Reid again. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and again, that was the left was like, okay, but I me mean, again getting Al Capone yeah. on tax evasion. <laughs> uh, then that didn't really have teeth. And then so they went after to try to go after Sam B. And that kind of caught traction. And she apologized and she did this thing where she submitted. And I, so many people mm-hmm. were pissed off about this because the whole thing is a disingenuous extortion racket. It's similar to the whole like, why don't Muslims condemn ISIS? Right. And then you show them literally 50 examples of Muslims condemning ISIS. And they're like, oh, well, they need 70 or, or 160. Like there's, a, there's some degree of groveling that liberals are never going to achieve because the whole thing has been an extortion racket. And it's something that Peter Hart at FAIR has been documenting since the early 2000s. That this is something that they do. They they cry foul. They complain about liberal bias in the media. And then people at NPR and, and, and New York Times, they, they, they scramble to sort of placate them. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, well, it's sort of like the Times today has an article about how Luke's uh, reporting hurt this local business in Brooklyn and uh, and basically implying that he should have called her brother's business because she, he, he mentioned that it, it exists in the article when like a large reason that Luke is getting so attacked right now is that he contacted the WWE because her, her, her husband used to be employed there. But I mean, that was a large part of the story. Her husband's business used to secure business in Muslim countries while she was trolling on Twitter. It's directly relevant and people are completely oblivious to that fact and it's, it's wild. Well, yeah, the idea that the outrage is that there are consequences for Uh people being super racist and super bigoted um, and that it's like, oh, well, you know, look, if she was doing this online, just let her do it. Don't ruin the livelihood of her husband. And it's like, no, 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 it doesn't work that way. Like, like the WWE, sorry, Adam, uh, (laughs) got to decide if... (laughs) <laughs> the fact that the wife of one of its employees who who does like, you know, publicity and partnerships, specifically like a gigantic multi-billion dollar deal with the monarchy of, of Saudi Arabia, which is itself completely grotesque, but that was apparently deemed to be pretty at cross purposes with mm-hmm. all the money that the WWE wanted to make. And so they let this guy go. But the victim here is not her husband. And right. it's not her. It's a complete misunderstanding. I mean, on purpose, it's right. deliberate to kind of shift who is being attacked when meanwhile, you know, if there are any repercussions, then it's the fault of a reporter. Right. I mean, in the Times instinct sort of to think that contacting the business to like let them defend themselves in the first place uh it's like easy to look through the prism of sort of their lens and think oh she should have called for comment but it's clearly it's been abundantly clear over the past few days that people would have seized on that as just more fuel to attack luke for trying to tear families apart and and there's no the way they see as there's like some line where you can be civil and the right will be assuaged and not attack you is insane and i feel like they're there's just no learning that no matter how many times this happens. Right, because it's an extortion racket and every single extortionist in the history of mankind, the reason why you don't negotiate or try to placate them is that they'll just ask for more right. and more and more to the point where, I mean, again, these, the NPR has institutionally gaslighted themselves to not state simple facts, right? Mm-hmm. We talked about this earlier in the show. They won't say the word lie institutionally to describe Trump during the Bush administration, they wouldn't use the word torture, neither infamously with the New York Times, because they're so obsessed. And I think it's it's worse at things like NPR since they're reliant on Congress for you know a meaningful chunk of their money. There's this thing where I think people seriously think that they're somehow being prejudiced, as if being being right wing and believing that the earth is flat and that women should be chained to the to the stove is somehow uh, you know an opinion worthy of being aired. Right, right. Um, And I kind of get the instinct, right, because nobody wants to. Nobody wants to sort of stifle debate, as it were. But like, I mean, every, sing- every single time you you publish something or you write something or you air a news broadcast, you're making editorial decisions about what is part of the acceptable parameters of debate. But the Overton window, I think, moves more and more to the right because of this extortion racket. And I, and I think that to some extent people are saying that, you know, at some point we need to draw the line. And, and that's why, like, 
you know, as much as I may dislike Samantha Bee or find her, her politics to be – the irony is, of course, Samantha Bee traffics heavily in these right. – in the civility politics and spent a great deal of time going after protesters for not shaking the hands of cops, which we also talked about. But like it's worth defending people like that mm -hmm. even if you don't like them. It was worth defending Joy and Joy Reid because – they're going after them for all the wrong reasons. Like they're not. There's right. no. Mm -hmm. There's no earnestness here. It's like with the whole. Oh, Bill Maher compared Trump to a, an ape, and it's like clearly they know that that's not the same thing. Right. Like they know that they're not operating in good faith. Why should we act like they are? And bad people still argue with them as though there's like they will ever say, "Oh, you know what? You're right. I hadn't considered it that way." Like I'll I'll stop sending you uh, pictures of a journalist being beheaded. I mean, there, there's no point where that uh, happens. What do you think, Ashley, beyond continuing to call people out, continuing mm -hmm. to refuse to play the civility game, while still, as Adam just said, still really believing that it's not about just being vulgar, right? Mm -hmm. Like, that's not the end game. Like, calling Israel an apartheid state is not to be vulgar. I mean, it's to be, it's to be accurate. Yeah. It's to be accurate. <laughs> and, and, and yet that is, is seen through this prism of civility, through the prism of balance as uncouth alongside things that are literally racist, things that are literally destructive. What do you think beyond kind of continuing to to call that out, continuing to do your work? Like, where do you see this going? Is it just going to kind of amble <laughs> along? This is just where we're at and we have to hope that like enough people who deserve to get fired get yeah. fired and enough people who don't deserve to get fired keep their jobs? Like, where do we go from here? I, was like, I wish I had a more optimistic outlook on that, but and because I keep thinking that we've reached a breaking point where something has to change, but that has felt that way for years. And I mean, I have a hard time seeing any future that doesn't kind of go further down the path of couching these like grotesque and obscene views and polite language to make them palatable. I mean, I fully anticipate that I will one day, if not like a month from now, like a year from now, get fired over some tweet where I like tell Mitch Ricardo to go fuck himself and like that'll be it. I, I think it's, it's fair to say that the day John McCain dies, we, we will all three be fired. <laughs> We're all going to be fired. I can't even be fired and I'll somehow be fired. <laughs> I, I I think about how how much I just like cannot tweet on that day and uh, I, I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> Dude, Republicans but, uh, Republicans are going to be so outraged at the slightest transgression that day. Twitter's going to be terrible. <laughs> Not even Republicans, liberals and centrists. He, he is the holy grail. Oh, yeah. Twitter's going to be a nightmare. And Jake Tapper will be, sir, sir, like the entire internet. Jake Tapper will be weeping on air oh, for God. an hour straight. He does Wrap, owe his career Wrapped in a flag. That's, that's where he got his start as one of his court sycophants on the uh, Straight Talk Express. So. <laughs> huh. I didn't know that. When he, when he was at Salon, he was his number one envoy to like what, the, what was the left, I guess, at that time. Once a maverick, always a maverick. Ever. Yeah, well, I will say this, that the editor, Nick mm -hmm. Bauman at HuffPo, seems to be standing very strongly behind Luke mm -hmm. and other reporters these days. And I hope that that I hope that that continues. Yeah, I mean, one of the best things I learned from Gawker, basically, is that it's an editor's job, basically, to even if privately, they might have some qualms to publicly like defend the writer against any sort of mob, because it's almost never in good faith. And Nick Bauman is very good at that. You can't negotiate with terrorists. Exactly. <laughs> Unless you're Jeffrey Goldberg and you are a terrorist and you <laughs> hire horrible people and then yeah. you're called out on it and you try to defend <laughs> Kevin Williamson. And then you're like, ah, yeah, I guess he's a piece of shit. Never mind. That's true. Yeah. That was that was the uh, some liberal pushback that actually worked. Well, thank you so much for coming on, Ashley. This was extremely insightful. Yes, this has been so great. Ashley Feinberg, senior reporter at the Huffington Post. Thank you so much for joining us today on Citations Needed. Thank you. Yeah, so these things are not abstract. I think the issue of Luke O'Brien and, and what happened to her colleague at Huffington Post and the backlash about that shows that shows that these intellectual conceits about manners and norms and civility and both sides of them sort of have their collateral damage, that they, that they have limits and that they, this kind of exposes those limits, that the media should have closed ranks to protect him from these right-wing onslaught, but instead decided to again accept these kind of super bad faith right-wing attacks as yeah. being in earnest when they're not. I mean, they're not in earnest. The Federalist is not in earnest. <laughs> right. the, the Daily Caller is not in earnest. They, they don't – they know the game and they know how to play it. And again, time and time again, the right plays asymmetrical dirty warfare and the left – and or I should say the liberals, yeah. they line up in a single file line like they're, they're the British. Well, right. No, and, the, and like to accept their fucking paddling. And I mean talking to Ashley was so great because as the reporter who broke – 
the story about James Bennett talking to the staff at the Times, it, it's 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 reminded me that there was a note actually before that meeting, there was like an all staff note sent around by the leadership of the New York Times. This includes CEO Mark Thompson, executive editor Dean Buckey, and Bennett himself. This was sent, you know, Barry Weiss had said some stupid shit on Twitter, and there was all this, you know, back and forth internally and externally at, at the Times. And the message sent around to staff is literally titled, A Note on Civility. Indeed, of course. Nothing better encapsulates the idea that, obviously, it didn't matter what, Barry Weiss had said. And then subsequently, I should point out, because of the backlash, Barry Weiss then penned a piece declaring, quote, the end of civilization. And Brett Stevens obviously rushed to her defense, calling the outrage directed at his at his right wing colleague insane. And so it's it's almost like quintessentially American thing of being brazenly aggressive and then being so offended personally, so easily taking offense, and yet having no conception of what your actions and your words actually do to other people. Yep, be really nice. Before we end, I will say that David fucking Frum is one of the most um, egregious examples of this civility discourse. So David Frum, the person who coined the phrase axis of evil, has established through his words and through his work in the George W. Bush White House a forever war that I don't know if we'll ever actually see the end of. And just recently, early June 2018, David Frum took to the pages of The Atlantic, where he's an editor, of course, to write a piece called The Antidote to Trump is Decency. David Frum ends his piece thusly, quote, There's a lesson here. Donald Trump and the political movement behind him are empowered by ugly talk. Their own talk stands out less sharply in contrast. Quote, You did it first. You did it worse. You did it more, end quote, are accurate enough answers, but they are not as powerful as not doing it at all. Well, I think on that note, we should call it a show. I think this was very civil. We didn't cuss a lot, so that's good. And so with that lullaby of inaction, of inactivity, we will thank you all again for listening to this episode of Citations Needed. You can follow the show, of course, on Twitter at Citations Pod, Facebook, Citations Needed. Help us out. Support the show through Patreon, Citations Needed podcast with Nima Shirazi and Adam Johnson. And a extra special shout out to... Our critic level supporters, they include Scott Roth, Andrew Nixon, Weed Lord, Nigel Kirby, Justin Williams, Rob McDonough, Aaron Durbin, Chris Breaker, Blake Bunnell, Max Belanger, Osman Hussein, Kevin Huxford, Greg Westney, Kyle Fritz, Bobby Wharton, Raphael Ciardia, Anonymous Ascendant, Zach Henson, Lucas Sharp, Eric Knight, Andrew Meyer, Esther Badola, Backup Scare, and of course, Computer Scare. Thanks again for listening. I'm Nima Shirazi. I'm Adam Johnson. Citations Needed is produced by Florence Burrow Adams. Our production consultant is Josh Cross. Research assistant is Sophia Steiner Evoy. Transcriptions are by Morgan McCaslin. The music is by Granddaddy. Thanks again, everyone. Have a great one. Citations Needed.